ulna medial and the proximal carpal row from lateral to medial are the scaphoid or navicular, the lunate. The distance between the scaphoid and the lunate is usually less than three millimeters. The triquetrum, which overlies the pisiform, which is shown by the white arrow. The distal carpal row from lateral to medial includes the trapezium, which is also called the greater multangular. You can see how much of the thumb actually extends past the trapezium normally. The trapezoid, the lesser multangular. The capitate, which should line up with the lunate. And the hamate with its elliptical shaped hook. On the lateral view, we see the lunate and the capitate line up with each other, as well as the distal radius. We can see the navicular, the scaphoid, anteriorly. And on the dorsum of the wrist, the white arrow is pointing to the location where the triquetrum is. A Collie's fracture is an extra articular fracture of the distal radius. It occurs, as most of these fractures do, by fall on an outstretched hand. Collie's fractures do not extend into the joint space. There is almost always dorsal angulation and posterior displacement of the distal fracture fragment. All fractures by convention are described by their distal fracture fragment orientation. And it is frequently associated with a fracture of the ulnar styloid, although it does not have to be. This is an example of a Collie's fracture. On the frontal view, you can see the slightly impacted fracture of the distal radius. The red arrow is pointing to a fracture of the ulnar styloid. On the lateral view, you can see the fracture of the distal radius with dorsal or posterior angulation. A Smith fracture occurs because of a fall on a flexed wrist. It is, in effect, a reverse of a Collie's fracture. It is also extra-articular, like a Collie's fracture. If it is intra-articular, it's sometimes referred to as a reverse Barton fracture. And there is Palmer angulation and displacement of the distal fragment rather than posterior or dorsal angulation. This is an example of a Smith fracture. You can see that on the lateral view, there is Palmer angulation of the distal fracture fragment. A Barton fracture is an intra-articular fracture of the dorsal margin of the distal radius. The fracture extends into the radiocarpal joint. There is usually dorsal displacement of the fracture, and this is an example of a Barton fracture. The white arrow is pointing to the intra-articular component of the fracture of the distal radius. There is slight dorsal displacement. A Bennett fracture is an intra-articular fracture and dislocation of the base of the first metacarpal, the thumb. It is the most common fracture of the thumb. It commonly occurs in fistfights. And a small fragment of the first metacarpal continues to articulate with the trapezium. It's called the Palmer beak fragment. This is an example of a Bennett fracture. The black arrow is pointing to the Palmer beak fragment that continues to articulate with the trapezium while the remainder of the thumb is displaced laterally. Here's another example of a Bennett fracture. The black arrow is pointing to portion of the base of the thumb which remains with the trapezium while the remainder of the thumb is displaced and dislocated laterally. A Rolando fracture also involves the base of the thumb. It is a comminuted intra-articular fracture. It's an uncommon fracture and its prognosis is worse than a Bennett fracture because it is more difficult to reduce. This is an example of a Rolando fracture, the base of the thumb. You can see that the red arrow points to one of the fracture fragments and the white arrow points to another fracture line. So this is a comminuted intra-articular fracture at the base of the thumb, a Rolando fracture. A fracture of the radial styloid occurs because of ulnar deviation and supination. It's associated with lunate dislocations on occasion. It is an oblique fracture of the radial styloid, and it is called a chauffeur's fracture, also known as a Hutchinson's fracture. It's originally named for the fracture which was caused by the hand crank, which was used to start very old automobiles, on the front of the automobile, snapping back and striking the distal radius.
This is an example of a fracture of the radial styloid. You can see that the white arrows point to the fracture line. A scaphoid fracture is the most common fracture of the carpal bones. It occurs from a fall on an outstretched hand. There is pain classically in the anatomical snuff box. And in about 30% of them, avascular necrosis can occur because the blood supply to the scaphoid is from distal to proximal. So that fractures, especially across the waist of the scaphoid, can result in avascular necrosis of the proximal pole. Early and adequate immobilization for up to six weeks is required in order to reduce the risk of avascular necrosis. Scaphoid fractures are also prone to non-union. This is an example of a fracture through the proximal pole of the scaphoid. The red arrow is pointing to the transverse fracture line. Here is another example of a fracture of the scaphoid through the waist of the scaphoid. Remember that the blood supply to the proximal pole of the scaphoid originates distally so that if the blood supply is interrupted through the proximal pole, this can result, which is avascular necrosis of the proximal pole. It's recognized by increased density sclerosis of the proximal pole relative to the remainder of the carpal bones. A triquetral fracture occurs from forced hyperflexion or sometimes an avulsion fracture. It's the second most common carpal fracture next to scaphoid fractures, and it will appear as a dorsal chip fracture, usually only on the lateral projection of the wrist, since the pisiform usually covers the triquetrum on the frontal view. So this is an example of a triquetral fracture. It is invisible on the frontal examination, but if we look at the lateral examination of the wrist, we can see a small chip fracture from the dorsal aspect of the wrist. This is what a fracture of the triquetrum looks like. Lunate dislocations occur from falls on outstretched hands. They are the most commonly dislocated carpal bones. They are the most severe of the carpal instabilities. In a lunate dislocation, there is volar or palmar dislocation and forward rotation of the lunate. The capitate collapses toward the radius, and they can be associated with transscaphoid fractures. This is an example of a lunate dislocation. On the frontal examination, the clue is that the lunate assumes a triangular shape rather than its usual quadrilateral shape. You can see that the capitate has collapsed toward the lunate. There are also fractures of the radial styloid, red arrow, and the ulnar styloid, white arrow. On the lateral view, we can see the lunate has been dislocated anteriorly, and the concave surface of the lunate, instead of cradling the capitate is pointing toward the palm of the hand. The remainder of the carpal bones are in their normal location, except that the capitate has collapsed toward the radius. Perilunate dislocations occur because of fall on an outstretched hyperextended hand. They are relatively rare. In a perilunate dislocation, the lunate maintains its normal position but all of the other carpal bones dislocate posteriorly. Perilunate dislocations are also associated with fractures of the waist of the scaphoid. This is an example of a perilunate dislocation. On the lateral view, we see that the lunate has maintained its normal relationship with the distal radius, but the remainder of the carpal bones are dislocated posteriorly relative to the lunate. The yellow arrow is pointing to the capitate, which normally should articulate with the lunate. On the frontal examination, we can see a fracture through the waist of the scaphoid. So this is called a transscaphoid perilunate dislocation. To recap, we've discussed seven fractures and two dislocations around the wrist. Triquetral, Bennett, Rolando, scaphoid, radial styloid, Smith and Collie's fractures, and perilunate and lunate dislocations. Now it's time for your mini quiz. Pause your computer or MP3 player and take a look at this frontal and lateral wrist on a patient who fell on their outstretched hand. What kind of fracture is this? This is a Collie's fracture. There is a fracture of the distal radius with dorsal angulation, classical for the description of a Collie's fracture. 